How many of you remember uh, Polaroid cameras? Oh, good. See, I, I, I'm clearly the dinosaur in the room with all this other tech stuff going on. But the pol I, was a, I was a kid when these came out, and they were all the rage, right? Because what a Polaroid camera allowed us to do was instead of trying to kill the last eight clicks on your thing and then wait a week for it to get developed and then end up only having two pictures that you actually wanted anyway. You could click this thing and a piece of paper would come out and then you, you flip it for like a minute. And then you have the picture of the moment that you wanted to grasp. The, that moment, because I think we've all recognized and we all realize on, a, on an ongoing basis, there's deep significance to the moments in our lives and things that can take just a moment or even less than that sometimes have the power to change the direction of our life and influence our life from that moment on. We all have those situations in our lives where what has happened in an instant sometimes has impacted the direction that our life goes from that point on. One of those moments for me, and it's not the positive side of this scale, was in the third grade. And I remember sitting there and the teacher was going to give, I won't mention her name because she might have a relative that's watching this, but um, she was about to give an, an exam back. And I remember sitting there at my desk, and as she came to my desk, she handed it toward me, and I, I saw red on it, which is never, never a good thing, right, when there's a lot of red on a test you're getting back. And as she put it on my desk, I'm looking at what was less than a stellar test. But then she said, um, it's pretty clear you'll not be the student your brother or sister were. So as a third grader, I remember just wishing the floor would open up and swallow me, and I could disappear. You can't cry, right? You're not going to do that. But I remember going home that day, and my mom would talk about this often. Uh, instead of having any little conversations about how the day had gone, I walked up to my room, I shut the door, and I got two pieces of paper. And on one piece of paper, I wrote everything that my brother and sister were good at. And then on the other piece of paper, I wrote everything that they weren't good at. And I decided I was never going to be compared to them again. So I was going to set out to accomplish all the stuff on this piece of paper and ignore this piece of... Now, the sad thing is this piece of paper had academics and things like that that were kind of, <laughs> you know, were kind of important um, down the road. But I decided I'm chucking that piece of paper and I'm going... They don't have a lot of friends, so I'm going to have as many friends as I can. They're not into sports, so sports is my thing because I don't want to be compared to them again. And I entered this whole world of comparing myself to everybody around me. Now, I was set up for a bad situation in this because as a kid, I was the third of four children, grew up in French-speaking part of Quebec, and so my brother, my older brother, liked to say, as the third of four children, he would refer to me as the third child. Um, <laughs> So as you, if you're a kid and you're referred to as deterred, so that's not a great thing. So there was that I was working with. I was the only one of the four children in my family to have to wear glasses. So when I was four years old, I was diagnosed as being cross-eyed. So I had apparently one eye that turned in, so I wore these hideous glasses for two years that hurt my ears and everything. And then I'll never forget being at the eye doctor's office, and he said, you know, his eyes aren't the problem, it's his face. Apparently, my face creates an optical illusion that makes it look like I'm cross-eyed, and I'm not actually cross-eyed. So I'm sorry if any of you are distracted as I look around the room, but that's, that's maybe what's going on. So anyway, that, I have all these circumstances in my life that kind of lead me to the place where everything that I could be comparing myself to, I'm coming out on the loser end of this thing. And it set me up for a very discontented childhood because I just always never felt like I measured up. Well, I was in for some huge lessons on contentment that started very shortly after that and continue to this day. It was not too many years after that. I was 11 years old, sitting in church one Sunday morning, and I remember the door opening and the, the kind of this commotion behind us, and in they came with a little wheelchair. I'd never seen a wheelchair that small before, and a little guy in it who was severely curvature of the spine, um, and his name was Ray, and he came in, they wheeled him in, they plopped the chair between us, we all kind of sat there not knowing what to say, and Ray said, sorry, I can't get up and shake your hands, and he kind of put us all at ease right away, and this little guy, if you could have stretched him out, he might have been four feet tall, but Ray had spina bifida, and again, all these challenges, but he became my closest friend. And during the next couple of years, every opportunity I had, he started tutoring me in classes that I wasn't doing so well in. 
and so many he couldn't go to school, so he was privately taking care of, you know, with his schooling at home. And I got to spend more and more time with this guy and just grew closer and closer to him. He started writing me notes. He'd hand me a note on Sunday, and I would carry it in my, he'd say, don't open this till Tuesday. Now, I know it's not real cool for an 11 or 12-year-old boy to carry a note from another guy, but I was carrying this note in my pocket, and I would open it up on Tuesday, and he would say, I think I remember you have a game today. You're going to kill it. You know, and all these notes of encouragement day after day after day, and I just couldn't wait to spend more time with this guy. Well, he got sick and had to be hospitalized for a while, and I hadn't seen him for a few weeks when my mom called and she said, Ray's on the phone and wants to talk to you. So I went to the kitchen because the phones were on the wall back then, and I started talking to him, and he said, you know, I've got uh, pneumonia. And I said, yeah, I know. My mom and dad said, you're, you're pretty sick. He said, well, I'm, I'm not going to make it. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm not going to survive pneumonia. My lungs are too compressed, and I'm not going to get better. As an 11, 12-year-old, what do you do with that? And he said, I've called to make sure you're going to be okay. That's Ray. You see why everybody loves Raymond? <laughs> um, that, that was Ray. And he asked me in that phone call if I would be a pallbearer at his funeral. And so I did that. And I, all I remember that day is carrying that little white casket and looking at it and going, I don't know how you pulled it off, Ray. I don't know how you were consistently that kid who was always looking out for everybody else. I shouldn't have been too surprised because I got to grow up with a dad who was, at the age of 28, went from within a week being a very healthy farmer and athlete to paralyzed from the waist down, a paraplegic. He contracted polio uh, at a time when he was trying to help some neighbors out and they had somebody in the family was sick. And so my dad, they only had one child at the time trying to manage the farm. And so my dad was hospitalized for a year and to, to take care of the polio and learn the rehab and everything. But I grew up in that kind of a household, and I grew up with a guy who never complained about his circumstances. Just never seemed to get him down, and I, as I got older, I appreciated him more. I was kind of just the only dad I knew, but as I got a little bit older and heard more of his stories, I grew to appreciate that in him even more. And I remember one time when I was about 16, we had worked some in the garden together. Our garden rows were wider than everybody else's because he had to shuffle a chair through and everything. But we had worked in the garden for a while, and then he perched himself against the car, and we played catch. And I had to be a pretty good throw because if it was off, it was going to bust a window or something. But, um, and then we went for a drive. And on that drive, I said, Dad, I don't know how, how do you do it. How do you stay so positive? He said, well, I haven't always been this way. But I had to learn how to focus. He said, because, and this is one of the most profound things I think he ever said to me. But he said, whatever we choose to focus on grows. Whatever we focus on becomes greater. And if we focus on the things that we don't have or the things that we can't do or the things in our life that aren't going the way we want them to, then that's all we're going to see eventually. We have to choose what to focus on because whatever we focus on grows. And then he said, our lives are shaped more by not the circumstances and the situations that pour into our lives, but by what flows out of our lives. And that's where our contentment comes from. And then he said, you think Raymond knew that? And I kind of caught me off guard because I hadn't talked about Raymond for a couple of years. He said, Mom found the notes in your pockets when you left your jeans to be washed. Anyway, my mom had found some of these notes where Ray would constantly encourage me. And Dad drew my attention back to that, saying, don't you, Raymond knew that. That it's not the circumstances working always to our favor that bring out um, that, but it's what flows from within. And he said, contentment comes from within. It's not a byproduct of everything working just the way we want it to. I think those relationships I was able to have with a young guy like Ray and with my dad uh, paved the, the way for what my wife and I and a bunch of friends would eventually do about 11 years ago. Um, we rented some ice and decided to see if we could get some kids that had some special challenges out on the ice. And so that was the beginning of what's uh, become the Capital City Condors um, family of special hockey uh, teams and you know we have one lesson after another after another almost every week we have these snapshot moments 
where we recognize that something is happening in this moment that is going to change somebody's life, and a lot of times it's ours. You know, whether it's a young guy named Chris that comes in, and every week before you can even ask him how he's doing, he comes over and he goes, I'm doing great! And he just gives you this massive hug. It's like, I didn't even ask you yet, but that's fantastic. Or, or whether it's our goalie, Zach, who's like six five and weighs about 285 and always wants to hug you the hardest when he's got his mask on so you get you come home with cage lines across your face because he just and then he says if I ever told you you're the best coach in the world and I say you mentioned that before and then he goes over to coach Dan as if I ever told you you're the best coach in the world and <laughs> and um you know but but that's the kind of thing or whether it's whether it's uh, Miss Chloe you know who is so thrilled to to be able to remove herself from the the apparatus that her dad actually built, or maybe it's watching her dad, who's built this apparatus to help his daughter out, and then he sees that other kids are taking to it, and so he builds five more, just so that more kids are able to, to engage and to, to become involved in the program and to see themselves improve. Maybe it's those things. Maybe it's a young guy named Tyson who has had 17 surgeries of his own, has Pfeiffer syndrome, which is a very rare condition. And when the BBC called and said they wanted to do a story on him and his condition, can we do that? He said, I'll only let you do that if you film my hockey team. And they said, they're from Britain. They said, why do you want your hockey team? He says, because other kids might need to see what helps me skate, and maybe it'll enable other kids to play too. His immediate thought is not how this show is going to tell his story, but how his story can impact somebody else's story. Or maybe it's Tyson again who has his make-a-wish come true and instead of just relishing that decides, I think I want to raise a million dollars so that a hundred other kids' wishes can come true. And this last year, Tyson pulled that off and he raised a million dollars so that a hundred other kids could have their wishes come true. That's what happens when contentment is coming from within. It flows from within and then it deeply impacts the lives of everybody around it, and everybody's life is changed. We get these snapshot moments week after week. It's unbelievable to be, I wish everybody could come to the rink and, and experience it for just a few minutes. Because we have these moments in time that we know somebody's life is changing right now. And I just want to tell you one quick story that happened just a couple weeks ago. We do what we call friendly games where our teams will play a, a, a community team, mainstream team from the community. And so we were playing with, uh, with one of our level three groups and we're playing this uh, team of 15, 16 year old boys. And during the middle of this game, one of the boys on the other team is a very tall young guy, number 17. He looks at one of our young guys and he goes, hey, what school do you go to? And our little guy goes, Earl of March. And he goes, oh, cool, I go to that school too. And our little guy goes, oh, that's cool. And then the number 17 looked at him and he goes, but I never knew you were a hockey player. And in that moment, I cannot capture what happened. Because our little guy got probably three inches taller. Because this young guy, this hockey player, had just validated him as a hockey player. So you could just see him standing up a little bit straighter than I've ever seen him stand up before. But what also happened in that moment was number 17 got it. And I can't even describe what happened to him, but he realized in those few seconds, in just that one little conversation, that he had changed our young guy's life. And he caught it. And he stepped over and he put his arm around him and they start talking. And I'm waiting to drop the puck. I said, do you guys, you okay, can I drop the puck? And he goes, oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead and play. So I dropped the puck, the puck goes down the corner. I look back, they're still hugging on the center line. You know, and when that day was ended, that number 17 looked at our young guys and said, see you at school on Monday. And that moment, it's a snapshot, right? But it's changed the direction of a bunch of lives, and mine's one of them because I got to witness that. That's the opportunity that's in front of each one of us every day. But like so many of the speakers have shared, we get so consumed and wrapped up in what's going on in our lives and in trying to find contentment in our lives, we lose the fact that that contentment is coming from within in the first place and it flows from within to have an impact on those around us. My dad passed away two years ago, just a little bit over two years ago. And six weeks before he passed, we were able to get his, uh, his memoirs uh, published. His book was called My Selective Memory. And uh, 364 pages of, of his stories. So it was amazing to get to watch him read that book and to, to see him hand a copy to the friends that he most wanted to make sure had a copy. But 
he had asked me to proofread it before, and there was one thing that I had proofread that I wanted to talk to him about. So when we had a few moments, I said, Dad, you wrote something in there that I can't quite wrap my head around. Because you say in here that becoming a paraplegic, losing the use of your legs, was one of the best things that ever happened to you. How do you get there? I can't imagine that. And I certainly can't imagine saying that that's one of the best things that could have happened to me. But he went on to explain how there's so many things. He said, your mom and I, we had to figure out what we were going to focus on. We had to realize that this meant a total shift in everything about our lives. But we chose what we were going to focus on. And we chose to allow the circumstances that we don't really have any control over. We, can't, we don't control the circumstances that happen to our lives, but we certainly do have control over what we do with those circumstances. So he said, your mom and I realized that we needed to try to turn these things into good. He has an, I can't tell you how many people's lives we've been able, hundreds of people that we've met and been able to share with and encourage that we never would have met if I'd still been working on the farm and hadn't been paralyzed. So he said, and when you think about big picture, he said, does it get any better than knowing that your life has changed somebody else's? So the challenge for you and for me today and tomorrow and Saturday is to find those few seconds in each day and see what you can do. What, maybe it's a small thing. Maybe it takes five seconds. Maybe it takes ten minutes. I don't know. But what small thing can we do each day that's entirely for the benefit of someone else without thinking about what we're going to get back in return? Because what we get back in return is a deep inner sense of contentment knowing that our life has been used in some incredible way to make somebody else's life better. And that is the source of contentment. Imagine finding that. Thanks so much for listening.